<clears throat> Hello, sir. Hello. Uh, thank you for joining in and uh, to all the viewers that we just wanted he need not have any introduction but still i know because many of the people were writing to me that we need him and we need to talk about snake bite and today is the day that we have the person and we'll be dealing with snake bites and lots of them so today we have professor david warren in one of the he's one of the leading world's leading uh, figure in tropical medicine and is the founding director of center for tropical medicine and welcome trust he has advised, among others, the British Army and the Foreign Office, the Royal Geographic Society and World Health Organization on the top, top, uh, topic of uh, tropical medicine. So I see uh, and when I'll also let you know that uh, how I was like inspired and motivated by his work. Uh, long back there was this WHO, uh, uh, I, I got a PDF when I was searching 10 years back or eight, nine years back when I was searching for a little bit of snake bite and I got a PDF of WHO uh, with all the photographs and graphics of snake bite. And uh, also the the photographs were so graphic that it was just, it just shook me. I never thought the dimension of snake bite could be as such. So slowly I thought that something should be done on the aspect on the area that i live in to get some idea of snake bite but i did not i as of now and I, I did not succeed but i know by setting an example many of uh, the people around india have uh, contacted him over a period of time regarding snake bite and they did substantial work in uh, snake bite research and helping people survive or go through a snake bite so uh, today we have the person and i hope you people can uh, uh, interact as well and i'll tell you the last 15 minute of the whole uh, program will be devoted for your questions so if you have any question comments you can uh, just write in in your message box and i'll try to read it to uh, Doctor uh, David Warren, and uh, in between, if you uh, if you uh, uh, there is one request that when you are writing down a question or comment, please do it in one single comment, not multiple. Then it becomes hard for us to take, and it becomes time consuming. So without further ado, we'll just uh, have, we'll just greet sir with a very warm good evening for India, and I think it's. Good afternoon in his place. So, sir, welcome and thank you for the time, sir. So, well, thank you. Thank you, Jayaditya, for your invitation. And I must start by saying that, uh, of course, you're the, in, in the world of snake bite, um, Indians are in the lead. I mean, your doctors for centuries have known yes. more about snake bite than any other part of the world. So, um, I had to be persuaded that really you wanted to hear my opinion, but um, I can at least uh, put Indian snake bite in the context of, of worldwide snake bite because I've had the privilege of, of looking after patients in, in four different continents. That's so um, anyway, very happy to be here. Thank you so much that you gave us the time. So, uh, sir, uh, because uh, I just wanted to know at the very start that uh, like uh, uh, once, once some uh, doctors, when they start their journey and uh, they start with so they have like uh, issues like uh, they want to do specialize in working with heart ailment maybe cancer maybe nowadays uh, most of the doctor upcoming doctor will be more interested in viruses and so on and so forth but uh, most of the time even in the scenario in um, hospitals and all throughout northeast india i can say that doctors are not very well versed with snake bite and what to do why to do because uh, what i see is most many of the bite uh, still stays unreported uh, and uh, that actually does not give the additional pressure to the government infrastructure that they should learn more about snake bite so how did you start off um, how did you get interested to do with and even at your time when you started i think that there were even fewer people dealing with snake bite so how did you get motivated and interested towards snake bite well, this was purely by chance. Of course, in the United Kingdom, we only have one species of venomous snake and there are very few bites there. But um, when I started to work in Africa in the 1970s, uh, quite by chance, I found that I had a number of snake bite patients coming into my ward. 
and um, I quickly discovered how little was understood about snake bite. We didn't have any ASV in our hospital in northern Nigeria, for example. And um, when I asked the uh, senior doctors, the local doctors, they didn't seem to know anything about snake bite. And this led me to discover just how profound our ignorance was about this primeval medical problem, because snake bite's been a problem of an environmental problem of mankind from, I think, the earliest dawn of civilization. So despite that, uh, very little is known about snake bite. And um, it was really the, the um, plight of my patients that drove me to start doing research on, on uh, the mechanism of venom action in patients and also, of course, the crucial problem of, de of developing effective ant ASV antivenoms. So, sir, uh, since you told at the very beginning that you you uh, did work on four continents on snake bites, so I presume one of these continents is Africa, one is Asia. Apart from Asia and Africa, what are the other two continents, sir? Uh, Latin America and Oceania, so uh, New Guinea, the island okay. of New Guinea uh, in Australasia or Australia and Oceania. So these okay. are the four tropical continents. I've also looked after patients in, in Europe as well, but uh, as I said, the problem is much less severe there. Okay, so sir, I just, uh, I, because for other uh, diseases, apart from psychiatric disorder, most of the diseases are related to body and are taken as perceived as a bodily problem, but psychiatric problems sometimes though it's a of mind, but people, uh, people try to, uh, people start thinking something uh, very mystical, enigmatic associated with this uh, mental disorder. Also same is the case with snake bite where uh, social uh, perception is very different from other all other diseases as in case of mental disorder. So uh, I just wanted to know because you were dealing with uh, underdeveloped uh, continent, most of them. So I just wanted to know uh, the mindset because it's more of a mindset thing like uh, even if the people are going to the hospital in right time uh, doctors if they are equipped enough they can save every life i suppose or many of them but the problem is people are my, because of the mindset people are not going so in this four continent what are the differences in mindset that you saw in case of snake bites sir well as you said snake bites uh, snakes command enormous uh, burden of mythological and religious belief, superstition in, mm. in every part of the world, including in, in Europe, uh, where mm. I live at the moment. Mm. And um, that does uh, affect the attitude of someone bitten by a snake. Uh, many mm. people believe that a snake bite uh, it means you're going to die very quickly and mm. very, very certainly. Mm. Uh, in other cases, the snake bite may be seen as a sort of punishment Hmm. And uh, people who, uh, uh, if someone dies a snake bite in a village, in, for example, in Papua New Guinea, hmm. um, hmm. the villagers may seek out uh, a witch or sorceress or evil person in the village who hmm. they think has cast this spell. So hmm. this is, is uh, very much associated with snake bite. And that has been one of the barriers to are making people accept snake bite is just like any other disease. You know, it's just a straightforward disease. The agency is venom rather than an infection or a, a cancer or something like that. But it's it uh, it should be treated in the same way as any other disease. So, sir, uh, I just want to know because many of people have already messaged me that they also wanted to know. So, in a community level or in a village level like what did you see like in different uh, region what did you see that the they do after a snake bite like what what are the protocols generally in africa what they follow asia we know a bit what about this latin america and oceania oceania so what what, what they basically do after a snake bite well in every part of the world there is a traditional attitude to snake bite treatment and for example when i was a, a boy scout in england uh, mm -hmm. I was taught in the Boy Scout, Scouts how to deal with a snake bite. And the first aid treatment was very, very wrong by modern standards. Okay. They make a cruciate incision and instill a, 
um, a crystal of potassium permanganate into the wound. This is terrible advice. And um, so the thing that has in common in all the countries where I worked on snake bite, in all those four tropical continents, a very strong um, uh, belief in traditional treatment. If someone's bitten by a snake, they don't immediately think, oh, I must go to hospital. Um, they may well prefer the tried and trusted traditional therapies based on herbs or other practices um, administered by local doctors. Um, doctors who are very accessible. They may be in the village or in, in the, in the neighbourhood. And um, that is the first line of treatment. And it's overcoming that um, attitude to treatment uh, that is one of the barriers to um, uh, implementing uh, modern attitudes to snake bite management. So, uh, uh, sir, like uh, you have been to different parts dealing with snake bites and uh, uh, so like this problem you have seen. So, uh, like of all the continent that you have till now discussed and you have worked in, uh, for you, which is the worst hit area in case of snake bite? Well, as far as documented problem is concerned, I mean, a country where there are reliable figures, reliable, there's reliable evidence indicating the size of the problem, then undoubtedly India, because uh, not only has India been known for historically as the country where uh, the, do the local people knew most about snake bite and the, the doctors were most skilled at treating it, but it's it's also the country where um, trials have been done, studies have been carried out uh, that have uh, provided a very reliable picture of the true burden of snake bite, and um, so I'd have to put India top of the uh, top of the class, as it were, there. But um, of course, in other countries, there's an unknown problem. So if you look at Africa. There's an enormous country called the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is inhabited by a large number of venomous snakes, uh, a lot of human beings there um, doing rural uh, agricultural activities. And it's highly likely that a lot of people are bitten and die of snake bite in that country. But because of the almost constant state of civil war in mm -hmm. uh, Democratic Republic of Congo for many years now, uh, these studies just can't be done. So um, there's a lot of ignorance about that, but but certainly as far as is the known uh, uh, extent of snake bite, India has the, the best data and, and the very strongest reason to, to take snake bite seriously. So, sir, <clears throat> since you pointed out that India, my own country needs to take the snake bite seriously, uh, I have that the next very uh, general question automatically from this debate or discussion it will come out that uh, like a country like India where we are still having this uh, huge amount of snake bite uh, like in western country you have uh, venom anti venom which are snake specific so in India that you you know that we are uh, dealing with uh, snake venom which are uh, polyvenin which is composition of basically four snakes that we are having. So uh, what is your take on uh, a polyvenin and, and its effect? Like, uh, would you, I, I think you would prefer a, a monovalent antivenom, but uh, do you think the polyvenin is up to the mark for uh, dealing with snake bites? Well, no, I would not prefer a monovalent antivenom. I think that the idea of a polyvalent antivenom is a very good strategy in a country where there are a number of different species of venomous snakes. And I'll come on to this in my talk. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about the, the big four concept um, mm -hmm. and the strengths and weaknesses of the uh, Indian, current Indian antivenoms. But I'm not against the strategy of having a, an antivenom that covers the uh, most medically important snakes of a particular region. I think that's a very good idea. Uh, because you can make it geographically specific there. And the big four antivenom is designed based on um, the earlier knowledge of which were the uh, most important snakes from the medical point of view in India. And I think it's been a very good strategy, a very effective one, in 
2020, of course, I think we need as many, uh, many Indian scientists and doctors would agree, uh, it's time to review this, to review the design of the Indian antivenom in the light of a great deal of uh, discovery in, in the area of herpetology. And I'm aware that possibly most of the people watching this um, will be snaky people, herpetologists rather than medical people. And it's really the enormous advances in discovering uh, new species and plotting their geographical distributions within India uh, and also documenting the harmful effects they have when they bite humans uh, that really should stimulate a radical review of the design and production, all aspects of Indian um, ASV. So, sir, before we go on with the presentation, uh, I would like to ask you the last question before the presentation section that uh, when we are dealing with uh, snake bite, and as we have already stated that we are dealing with the snakes, mainly dealing with cobra, elapids, and uh, then vipers. So, and then uh, elapids and vipers, but there is one group that is now getting some recognition is the group which is often referred to as mildly venomous or few of the back fang snakes so uh, like uh, in india there is still a debate like uh, not exactly debate but uh, how to categorize the venom of uh, uh, redneck killback like some of the snakes that are in between so as to say so uh, uh, what do you think about sir because most of the time when we have a snake bite scenario we have mortality in our mind but there is one more thing which is morbid like uh, we have to like in uh, green peat viper is not too much acknowledged here but in northeast what i see from my field work is that there is lots of bite in the tea gardens related to green peat vipers and then there is this mildly venomous so how do you, sir, uh, in the whole spectrum of snake bite, why do you place these mildly venomous snakes? And what is your take on this mildly venomous species? Well, there's no absolute distinction between mildly venomous and severely venomous snakes. And if you take this fascinating group, the green pit vipers, the mainly Trimerosurus, but other genera as well, um, if you see enough patients, uh, you will find some severe ones. Uh, the the usual, the average effect of a bite may just be a bit of local pain, swelling, and uh, perhaps mild blood clotting abnormalities. But um, the more patients you see, more patients you study, uh, you will start to see more severe effects. For example, acute kidney injury, uh, that is uh, kidney problems, and fatal bleeds. Um, fatal bleeds associated, for example, with pregnancy and with uh, childbirth. So I don't, I don't accept any uh, absolute distinction. I think we need to learn more about these snakes. All the time, uh, new species are being identified. For example, recently in Sri Lanka, uh, they've got a, a snake there that is, is now um, is a Rhabdophis selenensis, which uh, is capable of causing severe life-threatening envenoming. And that's only recently been recognized. So I think it's up to you snake people to mm. continue your excellent work of documenting the mm. snake fauna of mm. India and uh, also trying, if possible, not just the, the range of species, but uh, how um, numerous they are, how they are related, for example, to some of the high-risk occupations of snake bite, particularly agriculture, you, mean, you mentioned the tea pickers. There are many occupational uh, risks of snake bite linked with um, particular species. True, true. Um, I'll give you many examples of that. So uh, I think we, we don't need to close our minds to this. But when we just come to design an antivenom, a polyvalent antivenom, we can't put every single venom into it, into the uh, immunizing mixture. We then have to make some distinctions, some decisions made on uh, relative importance. Mm. So clearly some species will be more important than others. And it may be that it's not, it's not necessary to have an antivenom to cover every single uh, venomous species, as long as we cover the main ones. And we have a, a fallback position 
so-called conservative treatment, that is supporting a patient through uh, a, a con uh, an illness of envenoming or envenomation mm. Uh, mm. without using AV ASV. Mm. So, so, sir, uh, so now in this part, what we'll do, sir, I think uh, we have devoted as the first part, we just basic introduction of whatever you do and whatever the global aspect is. So now, uh, can we go to the presentation, sir? Yes, please. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll go to the presentation. <clears throat> So you can sir, just guide me and uh, I'll just uh, change the screen and you can just go over it. Just give me whenever I need to go over. Yes, yeah, so just, just to introduce myself, I, I make it clear that I'm a, I'm a, a doctor, um, a clinical doctor, uh, as it were, a bedside doctor. Um, I look after patients and the research I do is based on what I see at the bedside, what I learn from my patients, what I learn from treating them. And um, I realize that many people in this audience today will know a lot about this subject, far more than I do about some aspects, no doubt. But I wanted to try and give, based on what Jayaditya told me um, he thought might be relevant, I wanted to give a, a basic idea just the, the, the essentials, as it were, the essentials of snake bite. So I'm not going to go into anything in great detail. Um, if it seems to be too elementary, please don't feel insulted. I just want <laughs> to uh, uh, make it a level that's, that's uh, of, of interest and is understandable to a, a wider range of people, uh, not the sort of medical people I, I usually speak to or try to teach. So... so uh, that is what we want, sir. Mm, good. So as you can see, that my title slide captures really the tragedy, the urgency, the, uh, um, the, the desperate state of snake bite in many parts of the world. This is a, um, a child, I think, probably with a crate, crate bite envenomation, so becoming paralyzed uh, in the floodwaters of Sindh province in the eastern part of uh, Pakistan, right up against the border with India, being conveyed by boat uh, to the nearest medical care. And it doesn't look good. The child's condition looks very bad. I think it's probably dying of paralysis of its breathing muscles. So this is a very horrible and tragic case, but I think it puts together in one picture um, many of the uh, challenges that uh, motivate doctors to try and do better for patients with snake bite, and it should mot motivate us all, uh, snake enthusiasts, to uh, teach people more about how to um, prevent snake bite by understanding more about the snake behavior. Next, please. Yes. So this is very elementary background. Uh, there are uh, four important families of medically important snakes. Uh, two of them are major families, the Viperidae, which includes the Old World Vipers, uh, featured in this book by, um, uh, that I contributed to a few years ago, and the Pit Vipers. And in India, you have both um, non-Pit Vipers and Pit Vipers, the Viperinae and the Crotalinae. Then the second uh, very important major family are the Elapids, which include Asian specialities such as cobras, crates, and um, uh, and so on. And in other parts of the world, in Africa, there are mambas. In the Western Hemisphere, coral snakes. Then you have in um, Australia, uh, New Guinea, and the um, the Western Pacific, you have uh, elapids, which have unusual effects, venom effects, and. Um, all the venomous sea snakes, all the venomous sea snakes and sea crates are also elapids. Next, please. Yes. And then yes, there. Are yes. 
yes sir so in between i'll just uh, ask you one question that comes to my mind like you just told the inf uh, infestation or the uh, the way the, the impact of venom is seen so do you see across the geographical range throughout africa and asia do you see any change in the uh, toxicology of uh, elapid bite like in cobra in case of africa do you, the, is the manifestation little different from that of asian cobras there are similarities and there are differences for example, in Africa, uh, spitting cobras are very important. Um, yes. they, they produce unusual clinical effects rather than causing paralysis, like the little <laughs> child with the crepe bite I showed you in my first slide. Uh, they don't produce paralysis, but they do cause local tissue destruction or gangrene around mm -hmm. the area of the bite. Um, on the other hand, there are other cobras in uh, Africa, such as the Cape Cobra, that are, mm -hmm. have an extremely paralytic venom, uh, just like the classic effects of uh, Indian cobras. Um, so th uh, there is there is geographical uh, diversity, uh, but some similarities. Okay, sir. Should I go to next slide, this sir? Next one. Okay. And these are the two minor families. Um, you may not know much about the Atractaspidinae, these are the burrowing asps or stiletto snakes or side stabbing snakes. Uh, recently I published a book, a monograph on this fascinating group with, with my colleague Scott Weinstein. Um, and they're, they're confined to Africa and the Middle East. And um, they have uh, a, a unique venom toxin. Uh, which affects the heart and blood vessels in a unique way, which I, I might mention later. And then the second group, the ones that uh, Jayaditi I mentioned a few minutes ago, um, they're now put together in this with this blanket term, non-front fanged snakes rather than back fanged snakes. I used to call them back fanged snakes, but it's been pointed out to me by uh, Scott Weinstein that it's really um, more precise to say non-front fanged. Uh, and this includes some extremely dangerous snakes in Africa, such as the bomb slang and the twig snakes, the um, uh, Dysphalidus and Thelotornis. But um, in in Asia, there are some d dangerous ones. The uh, in Japan and Korea, they have the the um, um, tigrinus. Uh, that's right, the Yamakagashi, yes. uh, Rhabdophis tigrinus. And in Southeast Asia, in fact, in Thailand, where I was working, and in uh, Myanmar and other countries, um, there's Rhabdophis subminiatus, both of which are capable of causing fatal um, envenoming. Um, so, uh, and South America has a number of, of uh, dangerous uh, non-front fanged snakes. But the two, the two families I've mentioned on this slide are far less important. Uh, you could really forget about them, if you like, unless you lived in, in Africa. Next, please. So, sir, before again, I have one more question. Like, uh, why why did you, like, over a period of time, till in uh, our place in India, we are still using the uh, term uh, back fang. So, why did you alter it from uh, back fang to the uh, non-front fang? Like, uh, what is the rationale behind it? Well, the term back fang was because most of these snakes have their enlarged <coughs> venom injecting teeth at the back of the maxilla. Mm. But um, in fact, the maxilla may be uh, positioned very far uh, forward in the jaw. So mm. uh, many back fang snakes actually have their fangs quite at the front of the mouth. Okay. It just depends on the length of the maxilla. So this is a perhaps a, a rather academic and semantic point that uh, Scott Weinstein okay. prefers non-front fanged snakes. Okay, great. I understood. Yes, sir. This the next. Slide. So we to understand snake bite and to under and to appreciate more the extraordinary, the miracle really of evolution of venomous snakes and other venomous animals. Uh, we must know something about the the nature of venom. And please forget immediately the idea that venom is just a single dangerous, noxious chemical substance. It's not. It's an extremely complex mixture. Um, most snake venoms have more than a hundred different uh, toxic proteins and other compounds. And some have 
very many more than 100. So we're dealing with an extremely sophisticated and advanced sort of venom. By the way, venoms are poisons that can be injected. You notice I won't be using the word poison because poison's uh, something that uh, does you damage if you swallow it, mm. uh, like strychnine <coughs> or arsenic. Um, or some of the dangerous plant poisons of, of Asia, for example. Uh, no, uh, venoms are natural toxins that are injected through the skin. So um, amongst these proteins and polypeptides are enzymes, you know, they're biological catalysts. They promote certain um, uh, damaging uh, reactions or processes. And some of them um, are tissue damaging. These are probably the digestive enzymes, the, as it were, the snake's saliva, helping it to digest its prey. And some of the most important of these uh, um, digestive enzymes are phospholipases A2, metalloproteinases, which also damage blood vessel walls, causing bleeding, and hyaluronidase, which causes spreading of the venom through the tissues. Then a second group caused these very important blood clotting problems um, that uh, make patients bitten by vipers particularly uh, liable to severe, even fatal bleeding. Um, these are enzymes that promote certain steps of the body's blood uh, activate, blood clotting activation cascade or series of reactions. And then a third very important group, lower the blood pressure. And those of you with an evolutionary mind will be thinking about the relevance of these enzymes in, in the, the natural process of venom action, which of course is not a snake trying to cause a human being some harm. It's a snake trying to get its uh, catch and digest its prey, its natural prey. And so always remember that. Uh, that the effects of, of venoms in humans are not, as it were, intended in the process of evolution. They're a horrible accident, uh, which often results in the death of perhaps both the snake and the human being. Um, <clears throat> then there are these smaller molecule polypeptide toxin, toxins, and the most famous are the neurotoxins, which cause paralysis. And uh, uh, the these harmful effects um, are caused by actions at the, what's called the neuromuscular junction, where the nerve ending meets the muscle. So normally the, um, the, um, uh, the uh, uh, excitatory impulse would pass from the nerve into the muscle and cause the muscle to contract. But if a snake venom toxin has blocked that process, then um, you'll become paralyzed and you won't be able to move and ultimately won't be able to breathe. And finally, some of these polypeptides also uh, damage tissues, causing this local gangrene that I, I mentioned before. Yes. So next, please. Um, can we summarize how much suffering snake bite causes worldwide? Well, not precisely, because as I mentioned already, many countries lack the evidence, the really precise evidence about number of human bites, human deaths from snake bite. But we can make a guess about this. This, is, this um, map is based on the best available information at the moment, but uh, it's reasonably accurate in some places, but probably very inaccurate in others. So starting in the Western Hemisphere, the Americas, Latin America and Caribbean and so on, uh, about 4,000 deaths a year from snake bite. Europe has very few, um, far less than 50 deaths a year now. Africa is the big unknown, um, enormous country, enormous problems with snake bite, but very few reliable data. So probably many more than 20,000 deaths a year from snake bite in Africa. It's Asia that really seems to dominate the picture. And this is partly because, as I said before, uh, you've been ahead of the rest of the world in designing and carrying out really good studies to measure this precisely. And in the case of India, 
Sri Lanka and Bangladesh, well-designed studies have been carried out to estimate the number of deaths. And I'm pretty confident that those three countries together will account for perhaps 65 or 70,000 deaths a year uh, from snake bite. Finally, in Oceania, which includes Australia, Australia is famous for its venomous snakes, but fortunately has uh, very few human cases and deaths now. But New Guinea, which is still a developing country, uh, still has a problem. And um, there are at least 300 deaths a year uh, in, in New, the island of New Guinea. Well, the people who die then, a total of over 100,000 a year. Um, but you must remember that among those who are lucky enough to survive, many are left with permanent damage. And you'll be aware of the, uh, the permanent physical damage if someone loses a, dig a finger or a toe or loses a hand or a foot or an arm or a leg from snake bite. But what has only been, um, uh, become obvious recently is that many people suffer psychological uh, damage for many years, perhaps the rest of their lives. The um, snake bite is a terrifying experience and it leaves people with one of these, uh, um, the, thing, the sort of thing that soldiers who've been in action are left with or people who've had a very worrying disease may be left with permanent psychological problems. So it's, it's, it's the, the damage that snake bite does to mankind is not just the deaths, which are far more numerous than were re until recently suspected, but it's also this long-term uh, morbidity, the physical and mental suffering uh, that goes on uh, for the rest of the life of the patient. Next, <coughs> Sir, uh, I have that question, like in uh, this, uh, we have some data and studies on the impact on uh, impact of snake bite on the body. So is there any uh, published uh, record on the mental health of snake, site, uh, snake bite survivors? Yes, there have been several studies published from Sri Lanka on this. This is really what first um, indicated the potential size of the problem. These are quite difficult studies to carry out because in questioning survivors from snake bite, um, it's very difficult to not to put the idea in their mind <laughs> that they may have had a bad experience and are still <laughs> suffering from it. You have to be a very clever psychiatrist or experimental psychologist to de design the right sort of questions that will um, truly reveal this person's long-term uh, damage, psychological damage from the uh, the event of the snake bite, rather than something the questioner is putting into their mind, if you see what I mean. True, yes, I can understand. So this is concentrating on India and um, a study which I hope many of you have heard about because uh, it's been very well publicized in India, thanks uh, largely to my, my colleague uh, Ron Whitaker, who's really spread around the uh, this uh, recent publication on eLife magazine or journal. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an update of an earlier study published in, in 2011, uh, the Million Death Study, carried out under the auspices of the Registrar General of India um, by a group of very expert epidemiologists. Um, they are people skilled at designing uh, studies to uh, reveal the the frequency of a particular disease. In fact, this particular study was designed originally to look at tobacco-related diseases in India. But having put the structure in place, we were able to persuade them to look at snake bite as well. And the, I'm not going to go into more detail about that, except to say that this latest update date that was just published less than a month ago uh, suggests that there are between there are over a million snake bites a year in India, but even more shocking, during a period of 20 years that the study has been running, there have been 1.2 million snake bite deaths in India. That's an average of about 58,000 each year between the years 2000 and 2019. So this millennium, 
And even more worrying, the number, if anything, seems to be increasing, possibly with the increase in population in India, but it is certainly not decreasing. So that's a pretty massive figure and difficult to, to, to get to grips with. Um, it's interesting that 70% of these deaths occurred in just eight states, which I've listed down the right-hand side, uh, one to eight. Um, and um, uh, you see that 50% uh, of them occurred during the rainy season and 50% at lower altitudes. And I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. So the risk of dying from snake bite before the age of 70 in India is about one in 250. Well, if like me, you have difficulty in relating these sort of figures to a uh, real probability, it's still a, a frighteningly high uh, likelihood that you will die of snake bite. And I think these figures have been a wake up call not just for India, but actually for the whole world. It's really been the publication of these two studies in 2011 and now 2020 that have led to a complete reassessment of the importance of snake bite as a major global public health problem. Before that, people would always laugh it off and, and think you were some sort of uh, mad person if you talked about snake bite when there are so many other important killing diseases in the world. But the, these studies really put it in its right perspective. So next one, please. And just uh, uh, to, to look in a bit more detail, this science of epidemiology really answers the question, how often does a disease occur? Where does it occur? And how does it happen? What are the circumstances? of this disease occurring. In the case of snake bite, this is self-evident, I would have thought. It depends really how often a snake meets a person. Uh, this interaction is crucial, otherwise you wouldn't have any snake bites. It's the circumstances that bring people and snakes together, one place, one moment, that are crucial. And it also depends on the if you like the personality of the snake, and some of you herpetologists may not like me using that term for snakes, but irritability, how likely is a snake to strike? Because there's a great deal of difference between different species. I've worked a lot with saw scale vipers, echis, in many parts of the world, and I would call them extremely irritable. Get anywhere near them and they start uh, grating their scales together and striking. Um, and if you can imagine, if you put your foot or hand too close to a saw scale viper, probably in the dark, uh, you're very likely to be struck. Other snakes, and the classic example is this giant rainforest uh, viper from Africa, the Gaboon viper, which has the world's longest fangs, by the way, two and a half inch long fangs, you can pretty well tread on a gaboon viper and it won't strike you. So this is, a, I think, a very uh, one of the important variables in the likelihood. So snakes like Russell's vipers and saw scale vipers, very ir irritable and likely to strike. Um, <clears throat> another factor is the, uh, are the daily and yearly uh, or seasonal cycles of human and snake activity. Clearly the farmer's year in the sort of rural areas of India where snake bite is so common is dictated by the climate uh, when he can plant his crops and hope them to hope that they will germinate and as far as the snake is concerned uh, there are also cycles of activity to do with with reproduction and uh, I suppose with temperature and so on so it's these daily uh, yearly cycles but also the daily cycle of activity because Many important venomous snakes, as you know, are nocturnal. And they will, uh, I'm surprised to see when I used to keep uh, venomous snakes, to see how some of the crates I was keeping would become hyperactive at night if I went into the snake house after dark, whereas during the day they would be hidden away. So, I mean, you know much more about this than I do. But the, these cycles of activity are important because they determine when a human being is likely to come in contact with a snake. 
And finally on this slide, this very important factor of climate. Climate is to do with annual uh, variations in temperature, um, rainfall and resulting flooding. And you see there a picture from the million death study that I referred to earlier. Um, along the horizontal, which unfortunately you can't see, are months of the year. No, and, we can uh, see that. You can see. Okay, you I can't see. see. Um, along the vertical are snake bite deaths uh, in the study. And you'll see that the peak of, of deaths, <coughs> that is the solid um, black line, uh, is with the monsoon, during the monsoon months, which is, of course, the time of the greatest rainfall. And this is typical of so many parts of the world that snake bite peaks during the rainy season. It's not just because of flooding, by the way, it's also because of human activity, because that's when, in many countries, farmers will go out into the fields and start to plant when the rains start. Yes. Next one, please. <clears throat> and uh, look at the map over on the right there. The dark green uh, areas of India are those below um, 300 meters in elevation, uh, the dark green areas, so around the edge and the north along the, um, you can see there along the northeastern border of India, um, these areas below uh, 300 meters, and you'll see in the picture above that sort of glowing yellow, that's mm -hmm. the density of population. Uh, so these are all also the areas of densest human population. And in the graph, uh, you see that uh, below the elevation of 300 meters, that's on the horizontal axis, 60% of the deaths in the million death study occurred below an altitude of 300 meters. So it's, it's partly altitude, but of course, altitude determines which species of snake it will determine human agricultural activities, and it also will determine density of human population. So all these variables come into play in uh, determining how uh, a common uh, snake bite is. Next, please. So some other factors. I, I mentioned snake and human behavior. Um, so the uh, cycles of activity of snakes to do with hunting, of course, and mating. And as far as people are concerned, a whole lot of activities that are likely to bring people into contact with snakes, farming, building projects in areas of virgin jungle, travel, pilgrimage, pilgrimage, uh, pilgrims often walk early in the morning when it's still dark and in uh, barefooted because it's a, a sacred ground and they may become victims of snake bite. Uh, sleeping on the ground is one of the this is one of the great um, nightmares, I think, of, of living in South Asia, mm. is that if you choose to sleep on the ground at night because it's nice and cool, um, you may be bitten by a night prowling crate uh, searching for its prey. Um, and um, if you roll over in your sleep, and we know that this happens at times of night when people are having nightmares, most likely to be having nightmares and tossing around in their sleep. Mm. So if you roll over onto the snake, you may be bitten. And um, so that's a particular problem. Um, uh, snake handling. Uh, human beings have this, there's something irresistible about snakes, even though they're feared. And um, you also have the problem of snake restaurants, people gathering leather from snakes, snake performers, snake charmers, and so on, religious aspects of snake handling, and scientists, you herpetologists, of course, your enthusiasm uh, puts you at very high risk, although I would hope your knowledge uh, protects you, your knowledge of snake behavior uh, protects you. Um, then there are toxinologists like me who are interested in the venoms, and f the final group are children, uh, children, uh, could we have the next slide, please? Because I think this says it all. This this picture, which I took in, in a village in Nepal, in the Terai region of Nepal, um, showing, first of all, the figures from the Million Death Study 
in India, the highest proportion of deaths from snake bite is in the age group 5 to 14 year old. And no fewer than 3% of all deaths in India uh, were due to snake bite in that age group. This is astonishing. But looking at that picture, you can see how this happens. Of course, they've discarded their shoes immediately, although they don't look very substantial shoes. And they're playing around as children do. You'll never stop that in the undergrowth. And uh, they're um, inquisitive and playful. And that's how they are exposed to venomous snake bite. And that is why they suffer so badly from snake bite. Next, please. Now, the most important thing of all I could possibly tell you, uh, and I know uh, for a fact that many of you are deeply involved in, in um, prevention programs, so uh, I'm not talking down to you, but prevention <coughs> is the most important aspect of snake bite because it's the most uh, realistic way of reducing risk, most affordable, and it's the most effective. We know that. Um, and this is achieved through community education. So we need people, particularly those in snake bite areas, uh, high risk states of India, for example, to learn to recognize the local medically important species and avoid them. Uh, they need to be um, persuaded to avoid snakes at all costs. The sort of habitats which are very high risk for snakes uh, very popular, in other words, for snakes. Uh, and these would very much often involve paddy fields and areas of woodland and uh, areas by uh, rivers and so on, um, and high-risk activities. And we know what they are. They're very often to do with agriculture. So unless you have to be in those places, and of course uh, farmers have no choice, uh, they can't avoid the paddy fields, um, avoid those areas if you can. And two key things here are to work and to walk more safely. And you can do this by using protective clothing. Um, we know that most bites occur in nature um, in the lower leg or feet. And if only people could wear some form of protective um, footwear uh, the number of snake bites would be dramatically reduced. And I know all the reasons why people don't wear uh, footwear in hot climates, and there's expense, there's discomfort, and so on. And frankly, you can't transplant paddy in a flooded rice field wearing boots. I realize that. I'm not so naive. But um, nonetheless, uh, the there should be a big effort to persuade agricultural workers and others to wear protective footwear. And here's just one example on the right there. My colleague in Myanmar, uh, Dr. Utung Pei, has developed a lightweight boot, which was acceptable to farmers, um, particularly during the harvesting season when a lot of the bites occur. Uh, it wasn't too, they weren't too heavy, not too sweaty. And as you can see, this volunteer Russell's Viper is quite unable to penetrate the boot, even though it's been offered incentives, probably a few rats or something, it cannot penetrate the boot. So that's one very positive thing. And uh, also for people, for, for plantation workers who are picking fruit, um, some sort of hand protection. And at night, use a light. And uh, that's much more practical these days because there are cheaper long life batteries and so on. And take a stick and prod in front of you uh, if you have to walk at night. And finally, on this slide, I've, I've pointed out how dangerous sleeping can be, particularly if you choose to sleep on the ground. And it's now uh, been confirmed experimentally that uh, if you sleep under a well tucked in mosquito net, um, or even better off the ground in a hammock, for example, or on a, on a, um, um, a cot or a, a camp bed, uh, you're much less likely to be bitten by a night prowling crate. Next, please. 
Now on to the clinical side, the uh, medical side, if you like, of, of snake bite, the side that I've been most involved in. These are the symptoms that you can expect to experience if you're bitten by a venomous snake. And have to realize, first of all, that your symptoms could be caused by three completely different agencies. First of all, the very natural fear anxiety, which I think we would all feel. I mean, I've been bitten twice by venomous snakes, and I was certainly very anxious because I knew exactly what to expect, really. Um, so the effects of anxiety and fear can, can uh, have, have extraordinary effects. For example, they can make you breathe more rapidly, more deeply, so that you may become lightheaded, you may faint, you may get tingling of your fingers and toes, you may even get spasms called tetany, spasms of your uh, wrists and ankles. This is all the result of fear driving your breathing, making you blow off carbon dioxide. And also they make people do very stupid things like chopping off their bitten finger or something, um, or resorting to crazy treatments. So it can cloud judgment as well as having these uh, psych psychological and physical effects. That's just anxiety and fear. The second thing, and this goes back to uh, Jaiditya's earlier question about how do people normally react to snake bites in areas where they're very common, uh, rural areas. It's very often traditional treatment and um, uh, which which can cause their own symptoms. For example, if you apply a very tight band around your limb, a tourniquet uh, or a ligature, um, the limb may become very painful, uh, very cold. And if you leave it on too long, of course, you, you can kill the limb. Uh, you can cause gangrene just by that tight band. Um, but uh, making incisions, electric shocks, uh, ice packs, um, instilling uh, drugs uh, and um, herbs, for example, um, all these traditional treatments uh, can have their own effects. So that's the second cause of symptoms after a snake bite. And then the third one, which is the obvious one that we're all interested in, yes. the effects of the snake venom itself. And there's a problem with language here. You may have seen these two different words. Envenomation uh, was very much used in the American literature and some Australians use it. Uh, the English word is actually envenoming. But it doesn't matter which word you use. I've used them both during this talk so far. These are the effects that snake venoms have when they're introduced into the human body. They cause envenoming or envenomation. But having said all that, do remember what the, the sentence below, which is very important, about dry bites. About 50% of all bites by venomous snakes inject no venom at all. And that is not understood yet. Some people think it's defensive bite. The snake thinks, I'm not going to waste my venom on this guy. Um, others are much more uncertain. I personally think it's more to do with the mechanical efficiency of the bite which after all is not delivered as a snake would deliver a bite on its prey. It's delivered in a, in a split second when the snake is trodden on or picked up in a handful of rice or uh, something like that. But anyway, whatever the cause, this is the fact. On average, about 50% of all bites um, are dry bites. <clears throat> and that's a very good uh, basis for reassuring people who are bitten by snakes, not to get too hysterical about it. They may be lucky. Uh, of course, the dry bite rate varies between different species. The source scale vipers, Echis, have the lowest uh, high dry bite. Only about 5% of Echis bites are dry bites. Whereas the Australian um, uh, Eastern Brown snake, which is medically the most important snake in Australia, um, has a dry bite rate of over 80%, 80%.
So you see that, that variation, but on average, it's about 50%. Next, please. So most vipers will cause the features I've listed here. So at the site of the bite, local pain. That's very standard for snake bite. It's a painful procedure. Uh, bleeding from the fang puncture marks and swelling that spreads up the limb associated with bruising. And you may get um, painful enlargement of the lymph glands. For example, if you're bitten on the foot, you may feel pain in the groin. If you're bitten on the hand, you may feel pain in the armpit uh, because the larger molecules of venom are rapidly carried uh, in lymphatic vessels up to the lymph glands. Then you may also get blistering, um, formation of large blisters or bully, um, and tissue damage, including gangrene. Um, Vipers also cause a fall in blood pressure, so shock, uh, patients collapsing because of a low blood pressure. I've already mentioned that many of the venom constituents cause this uh, effect. And finally, generalized bleeding. Uh, you may detect this from the gums, from the nose, you may vomit blood, you may pass blood in urine, in feces, um, uh, or you may uh, bleed in the uh, genital tract. And the result of this is a non-clotting blood. The blood will not clot. So these are the common expected effects of viper bites. But next slide, very important. A few species of vipers have a, a wider repertoire of effects. And this is particularly the case with Russell's viper, which as you know, causes kidney failure. It may, in some parts of India, cause a descending paralysis. This is very common in Tamil Nadu. Usually only affects the um, muscles of the uh, eyelids and face. And sometimes generalized muscle breakdown, so that the muscles throughout the body break down. These are less common effects associated with just a few species of vipers. Next, please. Now on to the elapids. <clears throat> Most of the elapidae cause relatively minor local effects, and I'm going to give you an exception to that in a moment. But usually, if you're bitten by an elapid snake, you will get um, negligible or no local swelling. But the classical effect of elapids is to cause paralysis. And it's called a descending paralysis because it's first detected in the upper eyelids. This has the technical term ptosis but it doesn't matter what it's called as long as you recognize it. And the patient there is demonstrating it beautifully. He's trying to look upwards, but you see that he can't raise his upper eyelids. So his eyes are becoming covered. The pupil of the eye is becoming covered. And very often at the time when they will first have this paralysis of the eyelids, they will also always also be developing double vision. Uh, and their eyes are looking squint, squinting eyes. So it starts, the paralysis starts with the upper eyelids. It goes on to affect the facial muscles. The muscles are swallowing. The muscles that allow you to put your tongue out, uh, to open your mouth, to flex your neck. And ultimately, it affects the muscles uh, of breathing. And uh, if, if you're not treated, then that will cause asphyxiation. You won't be able to breathe, so you'll become unconscious through lack of oxygen and you will die. So that's the, the dangerous progression that you can see with a typical elapid bite. Next, please. Um, but a few species of elapids cause different effects. So um, as you, anyone will have seen, who's seen a, an Indian cobra bite, very often you will get severe local pain, spreading swelling, the tender lymph glands that I mentioned, blistering of the skin, and uh, gangrene, although it's usually fairly superficial. It only involves the skin and the tissues just under the skin. It doesn't usually go down into the muscle in the way that uh, viper uh, bite necrosis does. Some um, elapids cause this generalized muscle breakdown, particularly the sea snakes. 
that one at least one species of Indian crate, can, the uh, Bungarus niger, can cause generalized muscle breakdown. And some elapids, not Indian ones, um, can cause severe problems with bleeding and blood clotting. So if you if you uh, if you go east from India, keep going east, you will come eventually to the island of uh, um, of uh, New Guinea. But before that, you will cross uh, Weber's line, and um, you then enter the domain of the oceanic elapids, which have this uh, unusual effect of, the, of venom. And finally, um, some elapids have developed a defensive strategy of spitting their venom uh, into, be, into the eyes of perceived aggressors, enemies, uh, large animals and humans too. Uh, in India, I know that you, there are populations of of the monocled cobra, Nyakothia, in West Bengal, that have this spitting activity. But um, it's, it's pretty common in Southeast Asia. There are several species there, uh, Naya siamensis, Naya mandalayensis, uh, Naya sumatrana, and some of the Indonesian um, and Bornean species. So this is an, another uh, effect of, uh, another form of envenoming. Next, please. So that's all I'm going to tell you about the symptoms. Um, but what about treatment? And this is important for everyone to know, not just doctors. Um, so the first treatment, of course, is the pre-hospital first aid. The bite has just happened and you happen to be there. Um, it is important to reassure, um, comfort and reassure a snake bite victim because it is a frightening experience. And you can justifiably reassure them because you know about dry bites you also know that if the species of snake wasn't known it might well have been a non-venomous snake uh, it might not have been a snake at all it might have been a uh, some uh, um, legless uh, reptile or legless amphibian so uh, reassure them and it's then uh, correct to immobilize that means to make still the whole body because any sort of muscle activity will if venom has been injected will squeeze the venom away from the, the site of the bite where it's been the venom has been injected and spread it throughout the body and that's what you want to slow down as far as possible at least before the patient gets to some sort of medical care so immobilize the whole body and especially the bitten limb. And since swelling is the commonest uh, consequence of a snake bite in venoming, remove any tight objects from the bitten limb. Then the next thing is application of pressure pad immobilization. This is a first aid method which will, we hope, slow down the spread of venom from the site of the bite. Next, please. And this is the currently uh, recommended method. It's recommended because it's easy, simple, and it's not dangerous. So you, f you apply a pad of any sort of material you've got. Could be a folded up handkerchief, it could be a bandage, could be a bit of clothing, could be a bit of um, rubber tire or inner tube, um, what, what a bit of cloth, anything that you can roll up into a small ball so you can apply pressure, localized pressure, over the site of the bite. So that pad has been applied directly over the site of the bite. The purpose is to compress small veins and lymphatics, draining the area where the venom has been deposited by the snake. So by collapsing those vessels, you hope to delay the spread of venom, because venom leaves the site of the bite, not just by the bloodstream, not just by veins. As I've said already, the larger molecules, the enzymes, <clears throat> will go via the lymphatics. So this pad is tightly applied round the limb using a non-elastic <clears throat> non bandage. And the final step is to splint the limb, as you can see there with a bit of wood, so that the patient can't move because 
all move all movement must be discouraged and prevented. So that's the simple compression pad immobilization method. Uh, more work needs to be done on this first aid method, but the preliminary evidence um, suggests that this method is effective in reducing the leakage of venom from the bite site into the general circulation and delaying the onset, the development of life-threatening effects such as breathing paralysis or fatal shock, for example, at least until the patient has had time to be taken to medical care in a clinic or hospital. Next, please. So transporting the patient to medical care can be a massive problem, although I am aware that in India there are some tremendous efforts now to improve ambulance services and also the ease at which you can summon, you can call for an ambulance help if you've got a snake bite. Um, but in many parts of the world, this is one of the major problems, getting the patient to hospital. And it must be done as safely and as passively as possible. I mean passively, without the patient uh, moving more than is absolutely <coughs> necessary. Um, ideally, the patient should be lying on their left side. That's called the recovery position. So that if they do vomit, which is quite common after snake bite, you tend to feel sick and start to vomit up your stomach contents. If you're in the recovery position, you're least likely to inhale that vomit to, to block your airway. The next point, preventing early death um, during the, uh, the trip from, to the hospital. Um, you want to prevent death from shock or obstruction of the airway or paralysis. Um, you want to avoid any harmful time-wasting treatments. And I know I will offend some people by saying this, but I regard all traditional treatments as time-wasting and potentially harmful. And I know that many of them are harmful. And we have no evidence at all that any of the traditional methods um, contributes. So I would say avoid them. But I, as I say, I'm sure I'll upset some of you traditionalists. Um, and don't try to catch or kill the snake. Uh, that may sound odd coming from me because I'm, I'm the person who's really pushed for snake identification as a means of improving medical care of snake bite. Uh, I've really done everything I can to persuade people to, to identify the, the snake responsible. But don't try to kill or catch the snake for many reasons. Um, safety, uh, but also conservation. However, in many cases, the snake will have been killed or captured. I know even in a country like India that has such strict conservation laws, the snake responsible for a bite is not uncommonly killed. So if the snake has been killed, um, take it uh, to hospital with the patient, but do so safely. And another thing which is increasingly useful, I'm getting this a lot now, people will take photo, a photograph or ideally a number of photographs with a smartphone um, so, and, and send that. And that can arrive before the patient in some cases. The picture arrives at the hospital or at the poison center before the patient does and can be referred to an expert to, uh, to make the identification. Next, please. This is perfect first aid and it's real. It's not a, it wasn't a staged uh, thing for a camera <laughs> crew. This was a friend of mine, a very famous Australian uh, ornithologist, bird expert, who found a snake that he thought was a ground python in a remote part of New Papua New Guinea and picked it up with his bare hands, only to find that it was a death adder and it bit him and he began to develop paralysis. He was very fortunate to find these very helpful local people who built him a nice stretcher and provided manpower to carry him. I think it was for about 12 hours to the nearest hospital in Madang on the north coast of Papua New Guinea. So perfect immun immobilization of the patient and passive transport to medical care, perfect. Next, please. 
No, when you're um, dealing with a snake bite patient, you want to get the facts as quickly as possible because you want to make the right decisions. And what the doctor needs, not just a doctor, by the way, because I'm aware that in many parts of the world, snake bite patients are treated mainly by nurses or by health assistants or by health officers. So I didn't, I mean a medical person. Um, there are five quick questions you can ask which give you a lot of information on which you can assess the, uh, the risk and what's going on. First of all, where were you bitten? You know, point to the place, because when you look at the site of the bite, you will see immediately, is, is there swelling? Uh, is there blood pouring from the fang marks, even though it was, the bite was perhaps an hour, one hour ago? Um, so that, that's, or is there nothing? Or are there effects of, of traditional treatment that you should be beware of? Has the patient had multiple razor incisions made or something like that? The second key question, when did it happen? Because if it only happened five minutes ago, then it's very unlikely you'll see any effects of envenoming, even if there was envenoming. On the other hand, if it was several days ago, and I'm used to receiving patients who've had nightmare journeys over days <clears throat> by river, by lorry, by, uh, you can imagine. <clears throat> so it might be a long time ago. This will help you to assess uh, what you're seeing in the patient. What were you doing at the time? Because that can give you a clue to the species of snake. Oh, I was bitten while I was rice farming. That's a classic. In many parts of, of Southeast Asia, that would be Russell's viper would be first on the list. Not the only possibility, but the first likely one. Um, I, was sleeping on, uh, I was sleeping on the ground at home. Well, crate, obviously. I mean, there are two examples where the circumstances of the bite, what were you doing at the time, is very helpful. And where is the snake or the photo of it? Always ask that question. Uh, sometimes, they're ashamed to bring the snake uh, or to show it to the doctor, or perhaps the hospital staff have told, discouraged them from bringing the snake into the hospital. So that's, you must overcome that. You need to see the snake, or if there's no snake, see a photograph. And if the snake was killed, but not brought, then you send someone back to get it, one of the relatives to, to bring the snake, because it's very useful evidence. And the final question, which you may think is the most important of all, how are you feeling now? <clears throat> I'm feeling faint, sick, I'm, I can taste blood in my mouth. Um, and any of those symptoms are very important. Next one, please. Um, so medical treatment, um, you may need to resuscitate a patient if they're pulseless, apparently dead or moribund, close to death. And that step must not be overlooked. It's absolutely crucial. And um, so often in some, ho in some hospitals, patients, are not, patients with snake bite are not treated in exactly the same way, with the same urgency as other patients. I'm sure this doesn't happen in India, but I've seen countries where, um, oh, just another snake bite patient. You've got to realize the patient may be on the verge of death and you can do something about it. So the simple rules, and you, I'm sure some of the audience have been trained in um, resuscitation. So compression, airway, breathing are the crucial things. And then you look for evidence that venom has been injected, bearing in mind that it could have been a dry bite, even if you've got a Russell's viper there, a dead snake there that, that bit the patient, it could still be a dry bite. So look for evidence of envenoming. The common ones would be local swelling uh, and a low blood pressure or evidence of paralysis and obvious bleeding. Next one, please. Um, you should try to decide which species of snake was responsible because that helps you so much to know what the likely sequence of events will be, what the progression will be, and what are the greatest dangers posed to the life and limb of your patient? Um, 
depending on which species of snake. Uh, again, reassurance is important. And don't forget painkillers. My two snake bite episodes made me realize how brave my patients had been in not complaining about pain. It's a very painful experience. There are some exceptions. I know that crate bites are typically not painful, but most um, snake bites associated with envenoming are painful. So don't forget to give a painkiller and a safe one is paracetamol. It's a very good drug to give for snake bite, paracetamol. Then the medical person will need to make a very important decision. Is ASV needed? Is antivenom needed? Next, please. So what are the problems, going back to our earlier discussion, what are the problems with Indian polyvalent antivenom or ASV? Um, it only covers the big four. And the solution to that problem is that, as I've said earlier in this, this session, it should be redesigned now to cover perhaps others, other of the Indian cobras and crates and perhaps pit vipers, particularly the hump nosed pit viper, which we know is a very dangerous snake. It's confined to the Western Guts region, but it's, it's very dangerous. And I'm not at all certain that the other pit vipers are harmless. Um, mm -hmm. There are individual cases of, of severe envenoming. Um, and particularly when you move towards the extremities of the country to the north, the northeast, uh, where uh, Jayadikatika comes from, um, there, there are some very formidable pit vipers there. Um, a second problem is that the venom used in manufacture of the Indian antivenoms at the moment comes from a very restricted area or areas. There are probably, uh, the main site, as I think you probably know, are these marvelous irulas um, organized by Ron Whitaker, uh, who collect their snakes from a very small area. I've been out with them um, near Mamalapura in, in uh, Tamil Nadu, that's on the the east coast, southeast coast of India. And it's highly likely that the venom of the big four species collected there are not fully representative of the range of toxins or proportion of toxic elements uh, of those same big four species in other parts of India. Because this geographical variation in uh, venom composition has been very well uh, documented now in India. Um, so the solution to this problem would be to use venom from snakes collected from several different areas of the country. Another big problem with ASV is that it causes many adverse reactions, possibly fatal in some cases. And this needs to be addressed by improving the manufacturing process and purification. So India can be proud that it was one of the first countries to produce ASV in the early years of the 20th century. Um, the trouble is that it hasn't, the, the process of manufacture have not been reviewed since then. It needs a tremendous um, uh, spring clean, if you like, or uh, it needs re-examination, re revision. Um, finally, and this is my particular area of interest, not just in India, but worldwide, the safety, effectiveness, and dosage of antivenoms, ASV, is unknown. You won't believe that. You'll think, what is this crazy man saying? We've been using this for over 100 years. That is literally true. The sort of clinical trial evidence, the sort of medical evidence, experimental evidence that has been applied to every other drug used in medicine, antibiotics, blood pressure pills, everything like that, has not been applied to antivenoms. They have been neglected for over a hundred years. They've been, uh, very, very few studies have been done. And so I would repeat, we know very little about the safety, the effectiveness, and the optimal dosage of Indian polyvalent antivenoms. And although many of my marvelous medical colleagues in India have vast clinical experience, which enables them to use uh, doses which they 
they, they feel almost certain are effective. That is still the correct statement. And antivenom deserves, ASV deserves the sort of clinical trials and studies that have been done in other diseases. Well, we're nearly at the end now. Next one, please. So <clears throat> treatment of complications. I've already mentioned the patient may not be able to breathe. They'll need a mechanical ventilator. Um, just like the severe patients with COVID-19, their lives may be saved by uh, respiratory support, circulatory failure, kidney failure, and wound infections. And the surgeon may need to be called in to deal with gangrene, to do surgical removal of dead tissue and skin grafting. And the, the general rule for medical treatment of snake bite is keep the patient under observation for 24 hours, uh, even if they've got no signs and symptoms initially, because sometimes the effects of envenoming can appear very late. For example, I've seen crepe bite paralysis develop after nine hours after the bite. Um, so the only situation where I think you can let a patient go from hospital earlier than 24 hours is if you've got the dead snake or the photograph and it's definitely non-venomous. Again, this is an area where you <laughs> herpetologists can be so helpful. You can give an authoritative um, diagnosis of a non-venomous colubrid or um, uh, sand boa or something like that. Next, please. Um, when the patient is ready to leave hospital, that's not the end of the story. You need to try and restore normal function by physiotherapy and you must educate the patient so that they don't come back in again next week with another snake bite. This is elementary but it's often not done and it's a marvellous opportunity when the patient's in hospital to educate the patient, patient's family and friends about reducing the risk of, of further bites and you should arrange to see the patient again in case there are any long-term complications. Next, please. So, um, very briefly now, the challenges. Um, Jayaditya, yeah, have we have we gone over time? Should I stop now? No, sir, it's brilliant. If you are comfortable, we are very happy to listen to you. Okay, but tell me if I'm getting close to the limit, because I, I can see I've been going on for quite a long time. No problem, uh, sir. So the, <clears throat> these are some of the challenges to the prevention and treatment of snake bite in the community. And I've put there in some areas because I realized that in many parts of India, there have been tremendous um, community initiatives to deal with uh, prevention. And I've just illustrated one on the right from, from uh, West Bengal, an initiative that is rolling on uh, and is doing a very good job of community education. So there's a strong belief in traditional remedies and home cures um, and a great confidence in village-based practitioners. In some countries, these are monks or priests even. Um, this is understandable, but it's not desirable because it delays travel to hospital. And uh, I've seen many patients who spent uh, several days even with a traditional therapist before their condition deteriorated to such an extent that the traditional therapist panicked and uh, sent them to hospital. The second thing is that the, the remoteness of some of the snake bite hotspots um, in remote rural areas, they're distant from clinics and other medical establishments. <coughs> and um, this hinders people's access to medical care. If it's going to take you hours and very difficult, expensive journey, particularly at night, uh, to get to medical care, that's going to discourage the, the journey. And um, a lack of enthusiastic advocates and educational networks can also prevent community education. So not all parts of India are equally enlightened about the importance of community education. Next, please. In the case of um, challenges to prevention and treatment in, in hospitals, again, it only applies to some cases. Um, 
so in some areas there's an inadequate health system um i've already mentioned ambulance services uh, and again i should say there have been excellent initiatives in many parts of india and other parts of the world and you see illustrated on the right there a marvelous idea uh, developed by my colleague dr sanjeev sharma in the Tarai region of nepal of getting volunteer motorcyclists village based volunteer motorcyclists to take patients snake bite patients uh, from areas where there are no roads and this method's been used in other parts of the world not just for snake bite also for for evacuating obstetrical uh, childbirth uh, emergencies too and again this is a genuine picture it's not a a fake um this is a a young boy has got early paralysis from a cobra bite he's being taken by motorbike the pillion uh, passenger is his father he's keeping him upright it's it's quite a good position uh for this evacuation and the volunteer village based motorcyclist is driving him to the nearest first aid clinic and uh introducing this system in this region of the terai uh, reduced the case fatality of snake bite so it's it is proven effective um inadequate training of medical staff is a common problem inadequate supplies medical supplies uh, particularly of asv or inability to store it because it doesn't have a, a unlimited tolerance to high temperatures um the absence of intensive care facilities well that's very common in many parts of the world particularly ventilators this inadequacy is being highlighted now in the covid-19 epidemic as well and finally this step that you mustn't leave out rehabilitation means restoring normal function to the uh, affected limb and you see how important this is for a farmer so he's been bitten on his foot he's had a severe local envenoming might even you know even have needed some surgery it's not enough just to get him out of hospital to save his life he wants to get back to work again or his family or community may suffer so this is a a really important thing that's been left out of the equation of snake bite management in so many places next please so this is my last slide um at the moment it's very difficult to talk about anything but covid-19 in india at this moment you're suffering the most uh, rapid escalation of cases and in uk we've suffered very badly indeed and we're still not out of the problem so covid-19 is obscuring all other diseases research on everything else has stopped and patients are very often discouraged from going to hospital uh, unless they have symptoms suggesting of covid-19 so this is a real crisis and i think the diversion of most medical resources and research to fight the pandemic could have a devastating effect on snake bite which is already vulnerable it's already suffered from decades of neglect uh, only recently recognized how neglected it's been here are some figures from india about the number of hospital beds and icu beds and ventilators and how they're concentrated uh in eight of the uh, seven of the eight higher burden states which i listed in an earlier slide um there are very few of these uh resources Lo- lockdown is discouraging people or actually prohibiting them uh they may actually not be allowed to visit health facilities and i think that all this will uh, add up to a predictable rise in excess snake bite deaths that is i've already mentioned that india has perhaps uh, 58 to 60000 snake bite deaths a year increasing year by year i think that there may be an excess of snake bite deaths on top of that as a result of the covid-19 um i've got no solution I, there's no simple solution to that except that those of us 
who feel strongly about snake bite must keep our voices loud, keep our protests. We must maintain the profile of snake bite. And at our local level, we must do our best because it's very much going to be down to local initiatives now to make sure that snake bite patients have the best possible uh, chance of reaching medical care and that all the systems that I've discussed this afternoon or this evening about prevention of snake bite won't be completely forgotten. And we'll go back to the state we were in before where there's nothing else, there's nothing done about it. So sorry, yeah, Ditya, I've spoken for much too, for far too long, uh, because I always get carried away when I'm talking about snake bite. <laughs> but uh, uh, thank you for your patience. So it was really uh, very interesting, sir, because uh, I must say, uh, like even if it is a little longer, but we because this uh, serious issue, like if we are dealing with taxonomy in certain aspect of taxonomy of snakes and all, so there is a different issue altogether because that is dealing with something else. But here, a human life is at stake, and I think we need we need to know in detail about a certain. Uh, important aspect but once you are talking with covid uh, the very interesting thing that uh, came to my mind is covid may be a boon to uh, snake bite because uh, those uh, hospitals that did not have ventilators uh, remote uh, hospitals now because of covid they are bringing the ventilators and installing them so once the covid is over these ventilators may be very useful in saving the life during a snake bite in coming time yes i agree that may be an unexpected benefit uh, so that that I believe will be a great benefit in coming time. So uh, before I take on question, I see lots of questions have already arrived. So uh, before I take any question, I have myself some uh, questions uh, like uh, if it is possible to do all these things. So first question, uh, you told a, a bit about uh, antivenom may kill uh, by itself. So uh, in your whole journey as a physician, did you see a person or did you hear about a person who was rather not killed by snake bite, but was uh, died because of impact of antivenom? Yes, at least one. And I think that the, I don't believe that this is a common cause of death, but I mm. think that uh, very often if a patient dies of snake, uh, after a snake bite, mm. uh, their death is more likely to be attributed to the snake bite uh, envenom envenomation than to the antivenom. And what often happens is that reactions can come on very late after the, uh, after the treatment, particularly at night. You can imagine the situation in a busy hospital ward if uh, the patient has had their a ASV and um, some hours later they begin to develop life-threatening anaphylactic reactions. This may not be um, observed but uh, I'm not suggesting that it's a common occurrence, but it's a potential and it should certainly um, uh, stimulate the improvement of the safety of, of antivenom the, and also the assessment, the formal assessment of the safety of antivenom. So, sir, uh, I will take some questions now, but uh, I also uh, thought of something interesting, like while while you were uh, talking about the uh, traditional, uh, uh, those who are healing, healers, traditional healers. So uh, I think we are, uh, if we uh, conduct some awareness program uh, with a traditional healer who, uh, of uh, different villages and bring them to one umbrella so that uh, they can pipeline or they can streamline the patient through their channels because most of the patient will go to them in many cases. So I think there can be a very good uh, awareness program can be organized for those traditional healer who then can uh, streamline the patients to the main hospital and so and so forth. So they can also be a part of the umbrella of snake bite uh, rather than being an opposition to the whole uh, initiative. They can be a members of the initiative like many poachers are converted into conservation is nowadays through the practice. So uh, that can be a silver lining in coming days. Yes, I think you, you must include the traditional treat, uh, therapists and the monks and religious people in your programs. 
And I've True. seen the benefit of this in, I was first uh, um, working with Anselm de Silva in Sri Lanka, uh, talking with the Ayurvedic uh, therapist there, because Ayurvedic medicine used to be on an equal footing with Western medicine for treating snake bite, or in True. fact, far more popular. Um, and um, in Thailand, uh, one of my senior colleagues uh, involved the Buddhist monks uh, in uh, this sort of training. Uh, you're absolutely right. The, the important thing is to um, train them to recognize the dangerous features that uh, should lead to a, a, an urgent referral. True. And I believe that I, I, through my work, little bit of work, I have seen that many of those uh, traditional snake uh, 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 healers and all have a, a good idea regarding the tax, little bit of taxonomy of venomous snake and all. Uh, they know better than the common people. So, uh, sir, I'll take questions. So, I'll uh, the first question that we have now is from Sunil Sapkota, and uh, he's from I think Nepal, and he says my question would be. What would uh, it take uh, for South Asian nation to say, yes, we know snake bite and we can treat all of them? So, yeah. Well, I, I didn't quite understand the question. I'm sorry. Um, you mean what, uh, what, uh, not, not what knowledge, what experience would a South Asian nation have to, say, have to ha possess? So uh, what I, I think is, like uh, we have already discussed, he meant to say, I believe, is uh, what would sh we should improve in our infrastructure, in medical infrastructure, so that we are able to say that we are able to treat most of the snake bite. So as of the discussion, we already pointed out that these are the shortcomings and challenges that we need to fulfill. One of them was antivenom dosage, and we all told about the efficacy of antivenom. So and the infrastructure of medical and also the mindset of the community. This, if these three or four points are addressed, so I think we'll be doing better off with dealing with snake bite. I think so. Yeah, well, I think I've discussed the main points of, of any snake bite campaign. Um, it's, it's all to do with uh, community education towards prevention, uh, training medical staff to recognize important features of snake bite, improving the armamentarium, so the quality uh, of, of antivenoms and improving knowledge about how antivenoms should be used. And of course, educating um, medical people as well about uh, herpetology, because the problem has been in the, in the past, the snake, the snake experts were very good at identification. They knew which snakes were around, um, but they didn't know much about the medical aspect. The doctors were very good at treating patients, but they didn't take much interest in the snakes, particularly because they used to argue, look, we've got a polyvalent antivenom, we don't need to know. So many Indian doctors have told me that. We don't need to know which snake has bitten the patient because we've got a polyvalent antivenom. Well, that's something that has to be improved. But I don't. I think that uh, uh, India has, uh, has had a tremendous lead on most other snake bite affected countries in the, its wisdom in carrying out these um, uh, these uh, registrar general million death study to indicate the size of the problem. And I know that there's a lot of discussion at the moment about Indian antivenom, about how it might be improved. I believe that the Ministry of Health is being uh, approached and is will take an interest in this subject uh, after many years of, of, of not being particularly interested in snake bite. So I think things are improving in your country. True. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you, Jigmi from Bhutan. He is also watching. Thanks for watching. Uh, then we have a doctor from Assam, uh, Surajit Giri. He has some specific question. And uh, the question has not come as a full, but uh, it says green and golden pit viper in our area. I mean that uh, trimerosaurus group he is mentioning in our area, causing progressive swelling involving two to three joints, severe pain and coagulopathy till nine to 12 days in our last 25 patient. For severe pain and swelling, we inject 10 vials of ASV and 
then observe we have witnessed coagulopathy till 9 to 12 day. okay no swelling no pain but only coagulopathy we do not inject avs we just observe them for 9 to 12 days and we witnessed blood uh, coagulation in, uh, till now patients are safe without kidney kidney injury we closely observe them so i think it is his observation and that he just shared with you uh, well i'd like to, i'd like to say that you should not use uh, uh, indian polyvalent asv for uh, confirmed uh, pit viper bites. Is, is this Trimeris urus insularis? Which species is it? No, yeah, here we are. Uh, in, we do not have. Uh, in in uh, Northeast India, the pit viper that uh, we generally encounter are uh, Trimeris urus erythrus popiorum, and then that's the new species Salazar. Trimeris urus Salazar. But, but, but he, he said green and golden. Uh, green, green means uh, the trimerosaurus green means all this popiram and uh, gumprichetti and uh, meadowensis and all these are the green and the golden one is the new one which i think what he means is salazar is the golden color uh, anyway, uh, this is this is the important point i want to make that hmm. the current indian asv <coughs> polyvalent hmm. has no activity against the venom of Crotalini of pit vipers. Hmm. And so if you give antivenom to that patient, hmm. all you're giving them is risk of a dangerous reaction. You're not hmm. giving them any chance of benefit. So it's it's thoroughly bad medicine and you shouldn't do it. And if you if they have coagulopathy, you have to treat the coagulopathy conservatively. So if the patient began to bleed badly, or for example, if they needed surgery or they're about to give birth you would need to give blood clotting factors uh, to support them through that crisis. Otherwise, the right thing to do is to keep them immobile in bed. And as you've observed yourself, the coagulopathy resolves uh, within a matter of a week or so. But antivenom is definitely not uh, appropriate for that sort of patient. So uh, one of the biggest uh, takeaway from this discussion that I felt was this sentence and that most of us and i have myself encountered a uh, very close near and dear one being given uh anti-venom in case of pit viper bite and i as i told you these garden areas of northeast india there are lots of pit vipers and most of them are given polyvenin so uh, that's the biggest i think um, take home thing is to not to uh, give antivenom or uh, polyvenin for a pig green pit viper bite so uh, just uh, we have to treat symptomatically ap apart from that i think what's uh, just now said so uh, next uh, is like uh, i think uh, human in the ecosystem okay that's not a question uh, that's okay thank you rincon for your suggestion uh, Priyanka uh, says, uh, Priyanka Kadam says, Dear sir, many reports of children dying in snake bites are coming from across the country. So you are right, children are exposed to say Yes, thank you. So that's an observation. Uh, uh, a follow up question, I think this is a follow up question from again Dr. Shurojit Giri. Why neurotoxin affect the cranial nerves early than peripheral nerves? What is the earliest neurotoxic feature? I think that is tosis, as you said. I don't know, but it was uh, tosis or okay inability to swell. In uh, two uh, crate patient bite, we have witnessed first patient complaining swelling difficulty followed by tosis. However, we uh, he recovered with prompt and aggressive treatment. Well, it's a very fascinating neurophysiological question. Why the um, uh, leva levator sup uh, palpebrae superioris muscle, the upper lid muscle, should be the most sensitive to, it's not just to snake venom neurotoxin, also to um, the autoantibodies of myasthenia gravis and to botulinus toxin. But this is going to get very technical and medical. There is an explanation. It's to do with the anatomy, the structure of the neuromuscular junctions serving the uh, levator palpebrae superioris muscle and the safety factor. There's a very low safety factor there because of the, the structure. If he'd like to email me, I can send him some learned papers, but there is a very plausible hypothesis to explain this. And it's nearly always the case that the that uh, ptosis is the earliest sign. And I think it may be sometimes if you think that the another neurological sign is earlier, it's because the ptosis has not been 
uh, properly tested for or observed earlier. It has to be formally tested. So uh, we uh, we have we have almost come to the end of this session, and uh, we have taken all the questions. So uh, I am really very thankful to you. Actually, what I believe it's uh, the, the, this discussion should have been like a two part series rather than one part because we can talk more about it, and many people are still uh, interested in uh, talking about this, but because of the limitation, and we have way crossed over the time, and I uh, believe that you are you are now a little bit having problem of talking with so like one and a half hour, uh, like two hours almost. So, sir, I would like to take the opportunity from all of us uh, here who are watching this and will be watching in coming time, and so, Thank you very, very much. And uh, this was really impactful. At least one sentence that was the most impactful was that antivenom related to green pit viper that we, I, we most of us did not know here. And uh, the bite regarding green pit viper is very high. So I hope, sir, in coming time, apart from talking, we from Northeast India can also contribute through your uh, through your and the whole of your colleagues and co-workers support and uh, uh, help that we can start up something of our own for Northeast Indian infrastructure. I hereby through this program request all of us who are interested in this uh, so that we can form a umbrella structure rather than working separately uh, in their own areas where we can have a data exchange program and know more about the behavior of venom of Northeast snakes of Northeast India and share the knowledge and get input from experts like sir so that we are better equipped for the next year or coming time. So with this word, I will again uh, thank you, sir, for your time. And I hope in coming time, uh, uh, we can have a follow-up discussion when I come up with some results from Northeast India for you to see. Thank you so much, sir. Well, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. And uh, I've learned a lot from the, the discussion and from uh, interacting and I very much like if anyone has any specific questions if they could route them through Jaiditya uh, uh, I'd be very happy to give answers if I can. Surely sir I will take the question I also request you to just you can just mail me the question and I'll uh, provide it to sir and get an answer wherever it's possible and revert back to you. So uh, thank you all of you for uh, being here and thank you again sir for giving the time. Thank you all of you and have a very good night and stay safe, stay home. That's the main catch line of the series because we are in a very bad situation in COVID scenario because this is yesterday we had the highest number of COVID cases for India for the whole season. It's 55,000 yesterday. So stay safe. Thank you, sir. You to take care of yourself and uh, have a good, great night. Bye bye. Maybe bye. We'll be Bye bye, sir. And we'll be meeting you maybe with some other expert in some other field and discuss and continue with this series. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, sir. Bye, sir.